You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. I had a communication from a fan that inspired this show today. Start at the beginning. Let's 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 start at the beginning because that's a good place to start. It's a good place to start. So everybody knows it who's listened to this show long enough. Ed and I met originally nearly three decades ago doing radio in Champaign, right. Illinois. Okay, where I just went back this past weekend to get my daughter all registered for her classes at the University of Illinois, and which is really exciting and you know, what dad did is basically disappear and go find Murphy's Pub in the middle of the afternoon and brought my 16-year-old to get a cheeseburger and said she can go register for classes. This is where the alums hang out. But anyway, that, I had a wonderful weekend there. It was great. But that's where we met, doing radio. And then we both kind of split off and did radio in different places. And then eventually we reconnected again. And now we do Socks in the Basement. That's Chris's tale of woe. Back then, if you hated something I said on the radio, in the 90s, you had to call the radio station line and ask for the mailing address. Then you had to get out pen and paper or use your word processor and type out or write out a letter, which I would get from time to time. And normally, if somebody gets to this point, they've written pages. They've written how I should burn in hell. They've written how, how I'm the second son of Satan. They, 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 have, they have everything I've ever said wrong or done wrong and things they assume I've done wrong over the past six months and in the future all laid out on pages and pages of complaints. I always appreciated how you're always Satan's middle child. Somehow. Yeah, I'm not, the, I'm not the first. I'm the middle child. Then they would have to get a stamp, ladies and gentlemen, a stamp, and they would have to get an envelope, and they would have to put the, the letter in the envelope, stamp, Return address. They had to put a return address. So when they wrote the angry thing about me, they had to hate me so much that they had to actually put where they lived on the envelope. Okay? It wasn't like Twitter where you could just say whatever you wanted to and hide behind an avatar. No, no, no. The return address was on there. And then they had to walk down to a mailbox and they had to mail the letter. And I would read them. And they didn't know I read them. They had to be really angry and they probably never got a response because I didn't respond to people. And after reading such hate and vitriol, tweets don't bother me. Comments don't bother me. Letters don't bother me. You know, we get we get comments constantly on our YouTube page, through the website, stuff like that. And 95% of them are really positive. And every once in a while, somebody gets mad at me. And so I never respond to any of them. But this one, this one hit me a little bit differently. Because the guy that wrote it says that he met me a couple of years ago over at Cork and Carry at the Park. He's a proud sponsor of Socks in the Basement. Amazing food, incredible ambiance, uh, you know, the, the indoor-outdoor seating, the, the big giant bar with all the different options. The most beautiful staff, I think, on the south side, Ed. Oh, there you go. And they've got great food, and they're friendly, and they're good at what they do. Really good at it. They get the food out. They make sure you get over to the ballpark when it's time to go over there, bring the kids over before the game, big party afterwards. See more at CorkandCarry.com. But this guy says that he met me over at the Cork. He's from out of town. It was a big deal to come and see me at the cork and he was a huge fan and he's no longer a fan of my show. And why is that? What, what did you say? What was the most despicable thing that you could have said to drive this person who has met you, who's presumably shaken your hand, who has watched you eat food and still somehow come back? Yeah. Watched me eat food. I mean, you watch me eat food. Most of the times you're disgusted and you move on. Little known fact, I'm blind. Saw me so. drink the way I drink. And they were like, he's still halfway intelligent. Like that guy. Still three years later, up until now, big fan. Now, not a fan. Okay. Wrote to me that he was going to start listening to a different show. Gave me ex- explicitly which podcast he's going to listen to. Which, by the way, folks, we're really not in competition. We're all very different. We all do different things. Whether or not you listen to somebody else and you listen to me doesn't hurt me. Whether It doesn't hurt them either. You listen to me on Tuesday, you listen to them on Wednesday. It's all it's all it's all good for us, okay? Yeah, I listen, appreciate listen whenever. That that's a beautiful thing about a podcast. You can listen to us whenever you want. Right, you can listen to all of us. You're not cheating on me if you listen to somebody else just like you're not cheating on them. It's a podcast, okay? 
and and I appreciate everybody who listens out there, but that that was the thing I was told. I'm not listening to you anymore. I'm going to listen to these other guys. So what did you say that was so did you did did you say something nice about Jerry or Pedro? There were two things that I did. He did not specify, but one of our more recent guests, he was angry with. He or he's angry with you. He referred to somebody else I allowed on the air to take over the show and spew nonsense that he didn't agree with. So it's either James Fox talking prospects, Steve Paradzinski in love with Brian Bannister, or whatever you do that it aggravated him. And part of me wants to just blame you. I, I, I'll, I'll take it. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, nobody, nobody really, uh, nobody really pays much mind to me usually anyway. But okay, I know. don't know who it was. But someone pissed him off. So he wasn't really mad at me. He was mad at somebody I allowed to speak on the show, which was the first funny part. The second thing is he was really mad because Drew Thorpe had a bad game. Oh, good God. I was wrong. And this show that he was going to start listening to is right because I believe Drew Thorpe is going to be a good pitcher. The people that I had on the show over the last couple of weeks, both of our guests really like Drew Thorpe. I was excited about his first start and then he got blown up in Arizona. So clearly he's a bust. And I'm wrong and can no longer to be listened to on, on the podcast channels. That's, that's what I was told. And honest to goodness, the only reason I brought this up and started the show off with it is because it's so absurd that somebody got so angry at Drew Thorpe's performance that they felt the need to go to the Socks of the Basement website and yell at me for it. Like I had done something. And I think that's where White Sox fans are at this point. We can't yell at Jerry Reinsdorf because he doesn't care, right? And there's no way to reach him. We can't yell at the team because they don't care. Chris Getz went into hiding for almost a month, it felt like. Then he comes out before Tuesday night's game, and he says nothing for 28 minutes. 28 minutes of trying to avoid saying, I think my manager sucks because his owner won't let him fire the manager. He could have been like, Pedro's my guy. We think he's doing a great job. He didn't even do that. All we get is this mope Grafol who acts like nothing we say matters, poo-poos any reasonable question from the press corps, and just continues to spout nonsense. So you're yelling at a brick wall, and the brick wall isn't responding because that's how the White Sox operate. So then I got the ire on Saturday, I believe it was, with Thorpe when it was sent out. I got the ire because... I'm the only person who might respond. <laughs> well, shame on you for being responsive to fans who take umbrage at our opinions on White Sox baseball. And here's the thing. You can disagree oh, with God. something that I say. You can dis- Honestly, I expect you to disagree with me. Okay? I mean, I'm just a fan like well, everybody sure. else. I'm just a fan like I screwed up the other day, and I said that Burley, that, that I, I want to say that I said it was uh, Mike Soraka that they picked instead of Burley when it was John Danks. You and I both missed it because I was in the middle of a rant. I'm not perfect. I know I'm an you idiot. You even said it. And in the back of my head, when you said it, I went, well, there's no way that that's right because Mike Sorotka was on the team before right. Mark Burley was on the team. I know. But you were on such a rant that by the time the name John Danks finally crossed my head, we were on to another topic entirely. So it, it never even occurred to me to go back and fix that. But look, Drew Thorpe, I mean, our opinions and our takes on things are, are like you said, we're fans, right? We're not... I'm not a baseball insider, okay? I don't know anybody in the White Sox organization. I don't really know anybody around Major League Baseball. The closest I've I've come, and this is true, is my aunt worked in the front office as as an assistant when Jerry Reinsdorf and Eddie Einhorn took over the team. She worked there in the early 80s. That's why I'm a White Sox fan, because she kept bringing me all the swag, all the giveaways that came my way. It was great. But I, I don't... You know, and you're the same way. I mean, we know some people around the media. We know some some folks. We but, get some inside stuff. Yeah. But, I mean, like, when Ed's breaking down pitching, he, that's him figuring that out. He sits there and he takes a look at it, and we look at the stats, and I do the exact same thing. And every once in a while, I lean on people that I know are smarter than me. And and that's that's what we're doing here. And here's the thing. I don't care if you're mad at me. You think that Drew Thorpe isn't going to be any good? That's fine. I think you're wrong. Because I don't think that, I don't think that one bad game – from a guy who went from double A to the majors, a guy who was traded for Juan Soto and then traded for Dylan Cease because that's the type of caliber player that he is. A guy with that strut walking off the mound. I I know he doesn't throw really hard, and that seemed to be the bone of contention. His fastball isn't good enough, and other people have said it, and you morons think he's going to be good and you don't know anything. Well, guess what? I want pitchers instead of throwers because I watch throwers. 
come out of the, this, the most recent rebuild of the many rebuilds. And I watched them get blown up by the Astros and blown up by anybody that was ever any good. And all they did was beat up on bad teams when they were at their height during that very, very small window. I want pitchers. You know, we all celebrated Mark Burley recently. You know what Mark Burley was? A pitcher. A pitcher. He wasn't a yeah. thrower. He was a pitcher. Greg Maddox was a pitcher. And the idea that now that's old fashioned to want a pitcher, I think is ludicrous. Everybody's trying to reinvent the wheel with baseball, but I think that they're crazy. In the end, the teams that do the best, the teams that win in the postseason, the teams that the, the teams that thrive still rely on an awful lot of old school stuff. They use analytics, they look at they 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 break down the numbers, but they also they also rely on talent and moxie and guys that are able to stand out there in the middle of a stadium and then when the moment comes, rise to the occasion. That is still part of this game that we love. And I think Drew Thorpe is going to be fine. Now, he may struggle here, but that's why he's up now. You'd rather have him up now trying to figure it out. You'd rather have some of these young guys pitching now than be like, well, when they all get here, when it's time to start winning, they'll all just show up and be great because that doesn't work that way. Sox in the Basement listeners, switch to a new age of life. Keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa out of assisted living. Make it so they can get around on their own and live independently with stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, and even bathroom remodeling. Hyatt Home Medical Equipment wants to help you. They work with your insurance. They have 0% financing for qualified individuals. And they have the latest and greatest in CPAP machines. Unhappy with your vendor? Switch and get supplies directly mailed to you, plus test it all out in their showroom. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors and so much more. See everything that they have to offer at Hyatt Home Medical Equipment at hhme.com. And an angry email or message or whatever it was, and you can send me an angry message through SocksInTheBasement.com or you can leave me a voicemail, tweet at me, comment. Most of the players, I know YouTube allows you to comment. I don't mind them. Generally, I don't react to him, but I felt like I had to defend Drew Thorpe today and my feelings on him. And I'll be honest, at least I have something else to talk about because it feels like it's been monotonous over the last month or so with this team. If Chris Getz would have actually said something on Tuesday, then maybe I would have had that to talk about. But he didn't. He really didn't. He was 28 minutes. He may trade somebody. He may not trade somebody. He doesn't know when the team's going to be competitive, which is weird because he was hired in-house because Jerry said he could turn it around quicker. And he definitely didn't say anything that made me think he was going to defend his manager or that he even wanted Pedro around anymore. And he could have done that. Instead, let's talk about Drew Thorpe and why I think I'm right. And that guy is wrong. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about his velocity. And you were telling me earlier that Major League Baseball sliding now back into more pitchers than throwers and velocity isn't the number one thing. Well, yeah, here's the thing. Okay, look at look at all of the elbow injuries around baseball. They're all throwers, okay? Spencer Strider, thrower. Garrett Cole, thrower. Uh, I, I, I could go on. Jacob DeGrom. I, you know, I'm just going off of guys on my fantasy baseball team right now, to be honest with you. But, look, the, the point of it is, is that when you're looking at velocity, velocity comes from a couple of things. One, it's arm strength, okay? It's pure, God-given arm talent, all right? But, two, it's also spin rate. That's what gives the extra velocity. That's what gives the extra oomph. That's what's getting these guys to 100 miles an hour. Okay, and that's what's costing guys their elbow is because they have to grip the ball tighter. They have to use their fingers more. They have to spin that ball. they got to twirl it, okay? A lot of people think that the injuries are coming from sliders and curveballs. It's really it's coming from trying to grip and throw the hell out of a fastball. And so what's happening is... Just just a couple of weeks ago, MLB.com. Okay, so I'm not I'm not making this up myself either. Brian Murphy at MLB.com put a spotlight on nine pitchers across Major League Baseball who are succeeding in spite of having lower velocity. They are pitching. And some of them are lefties, are the soft toss and lefty guys. You know, you got guys like Ranger Suarez and Andrew Rabbit who are, you know, getting away with kind of that Mark Burley type of thing where the fastball can sit in the low 90s. But they can, you know, they can make their way through. But then you've got guys like Seth Lugo of the Royals, who's having a really good year again. You've got Javier Assad, who's across town with the Cubs, who's having a really, really good year. And Javier Assad, he tops out at 92. Seth Lugo tops out 
at 92.5. Bailey Ober, who's pitching decently for the Minnesota Twins, he's having some control issues right now, so he's getting lit up. And that's what happened to Drew Thorpe, by the way, in Arizona, was that his control escaped him. And I don't care how hard you throw, if you're putting it over the middle of the plate and you're not hitting spots, it don't matter because guys can hit fastballs. I don't care how hard you throw, if you put it over the middle of the plate, you know, and, and try and go through an inning, you know, like three times through a, a lineup, you're going to get rocked. And if you don't put it anywhere near the plate, they're going to take it because at 100 miles an hour or at 92 miles an hour, it doesn't matter. They're not swinging at garbage. It's not the way it works. This isn't the minor leagues. This isn't your beer league, okay? But Cutter Crawford, a breakout pitcher for the Red Sox, probably one of their better pitchers, and even Tanner Hawk, who's out there who doesn't throw overly hard, um, you know, they're getting by on hitting spots, changing speeds, mixing their pitches, doing things that Greg Maddox used to do, that Tom Glavin used to do, another guy that was a bit of a soft tosser that Jamie Moyer used to do, that pitchers have done and been very, very good pitchers. And I'm sorry, but go through all of Dylan Cease's game logs. Tell me when he wasn't a rookie that he didn't get his butt handed to him in a couple of games where he gave up a lot in the early going. Or that Michael Kopech hasn't been a disaster who throws really, really hard, by the way, but was terrible as a starter in spite of the velocity. So I'm sorry, bad take, and, and I will pick on people who do this, bad take that you think Drew Thorpe can't be a, a successful major league pitcher because he doesn't have high velocity. It's that He has led the minors in strikeouts. You don't do that. I'm sorry, you just don't do that without having the talent. But yeah, he's a rookie. It's going to get the best of him. He's going to have bad games. He's going to have his games. And meanwhile, I'll point to a guy that I, I got a little bit of knowledge of just because he's been sitting on my fantasy baseball team for years, and I sat around and waited for him to get done with his surgery, make his way back to the majors, and he's had about, I want to say, six or seven starts so far back for the Dodgers, and that's Walker Bueller. Now, if you're a baseball fan, you know who Walker Bueller is. He's a really good pitcher for the Dodgers. And he, he sucks right now. He's been terrible, terrible since he got back from his surgery. But the thing that they pointed out and what scouts have already said about him, because I keep reading about him, trying to figure out whether or not I wanted to trade him to you because you were trying to get him the other day, and you might have read the same thing I read. Walker Bueller went out and pitched one game in the middle of this bad run where he didn't go for velocity. Instead, he focused on control, and it was the only good game he had. He had a really good game pitching down in the low 90s. I mean, he's like 90, 91 he's throwing with more control over his pitch. And he went out like a pitcher, not a thrower, and he had a really good game. And that seems to be the struggle right now is that mentally, he's come his entire career being told you're supposed to be able to throw the ball really fast. And Walker Bueller isn't isn't listening right now to his coaches. That's what I'm reading between the lines when I read about him. But there are a lot of very smart baseball minds on very good teams who are sitting there saying right now, you know what? Maybe it's more important you know how to get a guy out. Maybe it's more important that you know how to control your pitch. And you're right. That's what got Thorpe. It isn't because of the fact that he throws a slower fastball. I don't buy that. I think a good pitcher can pitch. Look, if it's all about speed, why are all the position players basically... You take every position player in Major League Baseball, I think I saw the other day, and they have a 0.00 earned run average. Because they're throwing the ball so slow and the, and the players can't hit it. <laughs> so it's not all about speed. I'm ready to send, well, I'm ready to send Danny Mendick out there after reading that stat this week to go out and, and be in the rotation. Danny, every fifth start, you're going to go out and you're going to throw 45 miles an hour. Go. <laughs> well, and, and, and you know, it, the, the other part of it, too, is when you look at even on the White Sox, who's the best pitcher on the White Sox right now in terms of their starters? The crochet. Okay. And who's the second best pitcher? Fetty. Right. So you got one guy who throws exceptionally hard, but what happens to Garrett Crochet when he's wild? He's all over. Then, it, then it's a problem. You're right. It's a problem, right? Yeah. He, he doesn't always have a good game. And he had some bad games in there this year, right? Eric Fetty, who's been probably, you know, um, you know, and easily their second best pitcher and their most consistent in some ways, he tops out around 93 and a half miles an hour. That's not fast, right? He's not throwing 98, 99 and miles an hour. And he's a pitcher. Hour. He's a guy. He's a pitcher, who, right. and he, that's what he went to Korea to, to become was to was to refine his pitches, learn how to control them, learn how to move better with them, okay, and become a pitcher. Why is Garrett Crochet, you know, ineffective sometimes? It's because Garrett Crochet leaves hundred mile an hour fastballs or ninety seven mile an hour fastballs in somebody's hot zone, and they can crush it because that's just the, that's also the way of baseball. Hitters, quite frankly, are more muscle bound and have better exit velocities and better swing, you know, statistics than they ever did before. You just don't see, you know, you don't see slap hitters 
in the majors anymore, really. You know, when, when we talk about a guy that doesn't have power, it just means he came to the White Sox and forgot how to hit. That's all it means when you talk about a guy that has zero power whatsoever. But everybody has, you know, their, their swing mechanics are geared towards hitting a fastball, hitting a major league fastball, which is, tends to be an upper 90s fastball. But I'm sorry, it's just gone are the days when Bobby Jenks' 100 mile an hour fastball was such an aberration and such a novelty, or Aroldis Chapman hitting 100 miles an hour was such an aberration or such a, a you know, a, a unique thing that throwing hard means anything. It in doesn't mean age. anything anymore because all, all, all the hitters know that they can hit it. Like they don't exactly. become a major league hitter if they can't hit the 97 mile an hour fastball anymore. That's just that's just the truth. If everybody's throwing that. It's evolution. The batters have figured it out. That's why the way of the pitcher is the way to go. Look, I, if you don't believe in Thorpe, fine, and maybe I'll be wrong about it, and maybe one day somebody will point to the show and be like, that guy who wrote you the email was right, and you're an idiot, Chris. And Okay, fine. And that'll suck, though, sure. because this team is a lot further away if guys like Drew Thorpe aren't going to pan out. We might as well just close up shop and wait until 2030 when the old man is dead and then restart our fandom. But here's the thing. I, I, I point to all the fans who, a couple of years ago, when you and I were talking about trading Tim Anderson before he got bad. And we were right. Because we saw the signs. Or trading Yohan Moncada because he was never coming back to what we thought and he was going to we be. Right. Or maybe trading Michael Kopech because we had a little problem with Michael Kopech being a thrower and not much of a pitcher. I wanted to put him in the bullpen well before anybody else ever mentioned it. Remember, I got called an idiot about that constantly. Oh, yeah, and well before the White Sox were like, yeah, I guess we got to put him in the bullpen because guess what he can't do? Serve as a starting pitcher in the major leagues. So they came to that conclusion. Let me compare Drew Thorpe real quick to Jonathan Cannon because I want, yeah. I, I think this is a good comparison. Jonathan Cannon is a guy who we've heard multiple times this year when we first really started to hear his name and he came up for the first time and I asked people, we had, we had folks on this show, cover prospects, and, and we asked them, well, what is he? He's a solid fifth starter. He's not going to be an ace. He's not a top-end guy. He's a so solid fifth starter, though, and he's going to make this rotation because he's a pitcher. That's what I got told, right? And then he came up here in his first start for the White Sox on April 17th. He loses the game, right? But he pitches five. He gives up three hits. He gives up a walk. He gives up one earned run. Walks out of the game with a 1.80 ERA, and we're like, who's this guy? And then you know what happened in his second start? He got blowed up. He got blowed up at his third start. He went back to the minors. He came back up. He pitched three innings where he gave up three hits but struck out four. And then he sticks around. And the last start that he had on June 12th, at least as we're sitting here recording, I don't know if he's pitching tonight or not. He's got to be getting close again. Okay. He went seven innings with four hits, one walk, one earned run. His walks and hits per innings pitched, even with all those bad games in the middle, is the third best on your team and almost within that 1.30 or less that when you get to that, I say you're definitely a starter in Major League Baseball. And if you're in the 1.3 something, you're, you're probably a fifth starter on most staffs. And that's a rookie who's going to have his bumps, but you can see enough talent there that he's a Major League pitcher. He is not in any way as heralded as Drew Thorpe. And I think you got to give Drew Thorpe a couple of starts. I know it sucks. I know it's a long season. I know you're angry, but for crying out loud, like, give the kid a chance. He's 23 years old. He carries himself when he walks off that mound like he's older. And he's got the stuff. And you can see it in his track record. I'm not giving up on him just because everybody wants to find the next thing they want to be angry about or the next thing they want to wring their hands about or the next thing that they want to have anxiety over. Look, this team sucks. This organization's terrible. Jerry Reinsdorf is the biggest problem in Major League Baseball. He's one of the worst owners in history, and we're probably never going to compete until he's dead. I think everybody knows that, right? He's always going to be in the way of this team getting good. And when it finally does win a championship, I guarantee nobody's going to be around this front office that's in it currently. Nobody. But I'd like to see a better product on the field. I'd like to be excited about a playoff run. And I think that can be achieved while the old man is still alive. And they have enough pitching down there. And there's more coming that I, I, I'm i sorry. I am not ready to pull the trigger. I may be the only lone voice out there. I know the rest of the world is out there telling you, they got to trade Crochet. They got to trade Robert. Robert's always hurt. You got to move on from him. You got to do this. You got to do that. And, and I'm telling you right now, I don't think this is as bleak because I think, and I become it, 
I said it to Steve Perodzinski already, and he was just on the show. You can watch the video on YouTube for the full 30 minutes on our YouTube channel. Subscribe to it, or you can just listen to the portion of it that was on the last episode. I become a Bannister bot. He's convinced me, and then me reading about what Brian Bannister has done and what I knew about him before he got here. And I'm telling you right now, they've got a plan for this kid. Uh, Unfortunately, I feel like part of the plan is Martin Maldonado's got to be around all these young guys because he's... He's, he's like a horse whisperer or something. I don't know what he does, but they seem to love having him around. Maybe that's what his purpose is. But I'm going to believe in the guy who had results before, who's evaluating the pitching talent, who had to be the guy that Chris Getz looked at as one of his new hires that he brought in from the outside to do things differently. He had to have looked at Bannister and said, the, the, the Padres are offering me this package that includes Drew Thorpe, is this worth Dylan Cease? And Bannister had to have said, bring that guy here, I'm going to make him a star. I, I have to believe he's involved in the entire thing, and I have to look at his track record, especially in San Francisco, and the way and his methods and the way that the rest of Major League Baseball looks at him, and I have to believe, because in the middle of all this crap, I have to believe that that's one of the lights in the darkness. And so I still believe in this kid. Even if he has a, if he has a bad start, next start, I still believe in him. Write me more angry letters, I still believe in him. Well, and how can you evaluate a, a starting pitcher on two starts in, in, in any situation? And I don't care if he comes out and he was, let's say Drew Thorpe does have a 100-mile-an-hour fastball. Let's say he's got the most electric stuff possible. If he got blown up in his second start, could you would you write him off? Or are you only writing him off because, you know, all you've got is is fast, good, slow, bad? And and that's 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 all you can take away from pitching at this point. It's it's just not fair to evaluate talent at the major league level, a pitcher in particular, based on super small sample sizes. I'm not ready to to, to make my determination about Jonathan Cannon, Nick Nestrini, Drew Thorpe, uh, you know, whoever else they're going to bring up, Kai Bush, even Jared Schuster at this point. I'm not really ready to make a determination. Wait, but what I want to do is I want to see him, right? Yeah. That's the only way. But that's the only way we can figure it out is to watch them at the major league level. And if they struggle a little bit, okay. But but they can turn it around. Again, I'll go back to to our fallen hero, our our idol Dylan Cease, who is who is so wronged here. I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I watched Dylan Cease pitch. I watched a lot of his starts. Uh, you know, he was kind of appointment TV in some ways. But initially, when he first came up. Holy heck, the, the guy didn't look like he knew what he was doing on the mound. And then as he started to put it together and you saw the Cy Young runner-up season, you're like, wow, this guy's got talent. But what was he doing differently? He was actually throwing strikes, you know? And he was starting to pitch. He was starting to use his craft and use his weapons the right way. Drew Thorpe earns that opportunity as well. Heck, Mark Burley wasn't exactly Mark Burley at the beginning. Mark no. Burley was a guy who threw kind of hard and didn't really know what he was doing, and then he found a cutter, and he figured out a way to use that, and all of a sudden, bam, he's Mark Burley. He's the guy that we're, we're sitting here celebrating, and we're, we miss terribly, and we hate the fact that he left the team ever. Like, we kind of want him on the team right now, right? Oh, I take him. I take him right now. You know what I would take? I would take some logic still in the lineups. By the way, Jonathan Cannon... When you listen to the show, did pitch last night, so I'm sure he gave up eight runs after I made my point because that's just the way that things work. And we're not doing live radio, we're doing a podcast, and I still don't care because I, I think that this guy is going to end up being part of your rotation. I don't, I don't care. But here, but I'm looking at the lineup that got posted here as we're recording uh, for the game that would have happened last night for those that are listening to the show, and uh, and I don't know how all this worked out, but I, I do find it funny still that you got a Corey Jokes who's clearly earned a spot in the outfield and is better defensively than Andrew Benintendi, and Jokes DH'd, and Benintendi played left. And it just this is only because Andrew Benintendi is a veteran who's making the most money on the team. That's it. He's making the most money on the team. In fact, he's actually not making the most money. Juan Moncada is. But as far as the length of contract and the total overall cost, the five years and the $75 million, that's why he's sitting there in a DH spot. That's why he's in left field. Jokes is DH. Benetini's hitting above Jokes as well. And that, I'm t- I mean, this, that's why fans are so angry, Ed. That's why they're so angry. And, and, and that question might get asked at some point by somebody in the press corps, and Pedro's just going to get that smirk like, I know I can't be fired because the old man's not going to get rid of me. And the GM doesn't want to talk because he wants to get rid of me, but I've got one over on him. He's going to give a crappy answer, and that's why people are angry. That's why... The fan base is so on edge. 
And, it, you know, it, you're letting the terrorist win when you let the fan, but when you let them get to you like this, trust me, Pedro's going to make it through the year, not because it's the right thing, but because it's the wrong thing. And Jerry Reinsdorf does the wrong thing. And he doesn't like the fact that the peons have said that this guy's bad and he's going to firmly stand there like the narcissist billionaire that he is and prove you all wrong by keeping him around. And you know what Andy's going to do? He's going to get rid of him. Chris Getz will get a new manager in the offseason. And hopefully in the second half of the season, we'll see some more of these young pitchers. We'll see some of these guys develop. That's what I want to see. We'll see Colson Montgomery eventually make it here. We'll see a light at the end of the tunnel. And then we have to cross our fingers, cross our toes, cross our butt cheeks, whatever, whatever you need to cross, right? In the hopes that Chris Getz is set up when he gets into the offseason. Not with a ton of money. That ain't going to happen. But he hasn't just given away the whole team. That in the next couple of weeks, we don't just see trades being made to set up three years from now. And instead, what we have is we still have some nice players. We still have a crochet in there. We still have a Luis Robert Jr. in there. We're going out with the money that we're saving on Mancada and Jimenez, leaving the team and being bought out. We're getting a few professional hitters, and a new manager is going to come walking in and tell Andrew Benintendi, I really don't care what you make anymore. That's our only hope right now. And I know hope sucks. And I know when I say something hopeful, somehow it gets construed by a very small number of people that I'm shilling for the organization. Please, never think that. Because I think this is the worst run organization in baseball. But, I mean, what am I doing this for if I actually believe they're just going to suck for the next 10 years? I might as well just turn off the turn off the microphone, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't listening. I'm busy writing a, uh, an anonymous <laughs> email calling you a moron for having hope. <laughs> Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.